Welcome to Curiosity Kick, the podcast about ideas for curious minds and big appetites. I'm your host, Lee Delaney. On this episode, I'm exploring the stars of our solar system with Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith. Lisa is an astronomer, author and broadcaster, and her career has covered maintaining and developing professional astronomical observatories, as well as her own research and teaching. She has over 50 published papers and you'll possibly know her from the stargazing TV shows in the UK and Australia amongst other media appearances. Lisa is currently a professor at the University of New South Wales and is the Australian Government's Women in STEM ambassador. Do subscribe, rate and review the show on your podcast app. Reviews really help the show get seen by search algorithms. But for now, get yourself a cup of tea, grab a fork and dig into a slice of curiosity cake. Lisa, welcome to Curiosity Cake. It's really good to have you. Thanks, Lee. Great to be here. You've got a new book coming out in the UK. I think it's coming out in the UK soon, but it's already out in Australia. So can you can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's called The Secret Life of Stars, and it's it's my third book, and it's really an introduction to astrophysics for everyone. So not for your kind of ultra nerd cutting edge kind of people but people who just maybe don't wander up the science aisle of the bookshop too often uh, or people with a curiosity about the night sky so it's kind of presenting the the beauty of the night sky in terms of the personalities of the stars and I've sort of injected a number of you know personality quirks and traits um, into the story of the stars um, because you know, looking up at the night sky, stars may look the same, but they're actually very, very different. And some of them are pretty damn weird. So all of that will be uncovered in the secret life of stars. Yeah, I was really interested in that element of the book of linking stars and their behaviours to personalities. Was that was that a difficult thing to do or were there very obvious ways to, to kind of almost anthropomorphise them in some way? Yeah, I'm very impressed with you pronouncing anthropomorphize because I can't always do it myself. <laughs> but, um, it's oh, well, uh, yeah. Wait till wait till we get to some of the pronunciations of some of the stars. Oh later. God, I know, I know. Well, uh, astronomers have less impressive. Terrible, terrible naming conventions. But yeah, yeah, you know, making the stars human and, and personalizing them was was quite easy to do because you know even as a professional astrophysicist for a, a large number of years now. I still find the kind of notation that we use as as astronomers kind of annoying. And, um, you know, it makes it a little bit opaque as a subject sometimes, astrophysics. So people think it's hard and difficult to understand, but really it's not. Um, You know, we've been looking at the stars as human beings for tens of thousands of years and just trying to make the stars more familiar and making people able to um, access them is, is something I'm really passionate about. So... You know, given them personality, they've, they've already got personalities. You know, the stars like our sun are pretty average, middle of the road, you know, steady and, and calm. But so many stars are bonkers in many ways. They, they eat each other. They <laughs> compete. They um, explode. They have temper tantrums and flares. Um, there, there are some that live in, in giant families and do maypole dancing and, and others that just you know, live on their own and fly through the galaxy at a high speed. So they're, they're very diverse, they're very interesting. And I wanted to uncover that kind of personality side of things. And I think it's quite fun. It was fun to write, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, def- it's definitely fun to read. It's really not your average kind of dry psych- um, science book. That's good to hear. <laughs> That was the aim. That was the aim. You know, there's a lot of science books out there and a lot, you know, some people want to read really detailed kind of um, tomes on, you know, general relativity or something. And that, that's that got its place. But, you know, a lot of people just want to dip in and maybe learn something new, something they can talk about the water cooler or the, you know, the, the kettle and uh, work and just say, hey, did you know there's this star out there that, you know, just fuses its guts into space and does a fake supernova or something. And, you know, people find that kind of interesting. And I, I do too. 
Yeah, well, definitely me too, obviously, doing this episode. Um, but it's, it's not just an adult book, is it? Like, it's accessible for younger adults as well. Yeah, yeah, we've done a um, bit of market research about that, and I've been kind of curious as to what age range it was accessible to. And because I've written it with the personalities, I found that we've pitched it to a lot of young adult audiences as well, and we've had a lot of um, mm -hmm. reviews recently from young, ad young adult um educators so you know high school teachers and that kind of stuff and um you know they've said even down to about 10 years old 10 or 11 for good readers they've they've managed to kind of enjoy it and digest it so it's not a, a children's book as such but it's very much for the teens um a, a good introduction to astrophysics yeah but it's really uh living up to that that kind of title there of astrophysics for everyone which is cool yeah yeah that's that's quite important to me because you know, it, it, the taxpayer pays for science. And I think sometimes science is hidden behind the paywall in the, you know, inaccessible journals and the Royal Astronomical Society and those kind of journals that people can't get unless they pay thousands of dollars a year so or pounds a year. So, you know, it's really important to me that people can access science and find that it's fun. And, and really, for me, that came as a kid from people like Patrick Moore writing and and um, putting yeah. stuff on the TV and that that's sort of a circular thing I want to give back give back to that too yeah and your dad got you interested in the night sky in the first place is that right yeah yeah my dad um bit of a stubborn old bug and ne never did any exams or had any qualifications <laughs> or anything but he um, he told me that his dad my granddad um, was interested in the night sky um, and he used to show him the, the the stars when he was a kid, and then it kind of passed down to me. Um, I remember my dad. It was 1992. And my dad showed me the planet Mars through um, no telescopes. We didn't have any telescopes or any money to buy a telescope, yeah. but uh, we just had you know our eyes in the garden, and we went out and um, through the the orange glow of the street lights in an Essex village, we managed to see Mars shining through um, one of the constellations. I, I can't remember where it was now, but it was it was sort of overhead and <laughs> it was beautiful. And I, I just remember being kind of bowled over that you could see the planet Mars without any telescopes or any equipment. And um, that, that was the start of it for me. And then my dad bought me a battered old 1957 Norton Star Atlas, which is like a, a street map of, of the sky from the local Oxfam shop. And um, it kind of had moldy spots on it, you know, that <laughs> that look of an old book and that kind of dusty smell. They weren't just on discovered planets or something yet? <laughs> no, it was just a bit of mold. <laughs> it, was just, it was, yeah, like the old red dwarf joke about black holes just being specks of grit on the monitor. But, um, yeah, it was that kind of thing, <laughs> that kind of thing where, yeah, old dusty book kind of inspired someone to become an astrophysicist. And it was, it's a good story and it's, um, you know, it's, it's really taken me to great places and traveling around the world. So it's, it's been wonderful for me. Yeah. And it's a very, uh, human way into a subject that, as you're saying, can at times be a bit opaque and not as accessible to kind of ordinary people. Yeah. I find in the ranks of professional astronomers, um, there's some that come into it through amateur astronomy and looking at the sky and enjoying the beauty of it. But actually, there's a lot more who come in at it from a uh, more of a academic interest side. And I had both sides, so I was kind of lucky. Um, but really, what sparked my interest was just looking at the night sky. And I think you can't beat that. And I always feel kind of sorry for those professional astronomers who don't know where to find the plough or Orion or Cassiopeia or something. <laughs> it's kind of sad, but, um, you know, everyone's got their own angle, I guess. Um, so let's get into the some of the details in the book then. I want to start with with what's maybe a bit of a kind of simple or or stupid question, but you were talking about stars and looking up at the night sky. And when I think about it, if someone asked me what is a star, I don't think I could actually answer that. So I want to ask you. So like when my niece or nephew at any point says to me, oh, what actually is a star? What can I tell them? That is in no way a stupid question because <laughs> we were kind of told that stars are those twinkly things in the sky, they're lights, and maybe most people would know that the sun is a star, 
but it's just closer than the others. So that's the kind of limit of most people's understanding. And then after that, it's like, oh, not sure, which is totally cool because it's really complicated. And we, we've we only known this stuff for a couple of hundred years and really only known it well for, you know, less than a hundred years. So, so but basically a star is um, like the sun. It's, it's a glowing ball of gas in the sky and it's held together by gravity. So gravity is the universe's glue and um, it pulls everything together. So it pulls you and I down onto the earth. All right, I'm in Australia and you're in the UK, but <laughs> we're both being pulled towards the center of the earth. That's why we're both stuck on, even though I'm upside down. And, um, and gravity pulls together gas in the universe as well. And gas is all over the universe. It's like spread out throughout the sky. It's just everywhere. And little pockets of gas are pulled together by gravity. They form little balls, little spheres. And um, they're in fact pretty bloody big. They're they're huge. Um, you know, a star is is extremely big. Um, and then what happens inside is kind of like when you're in a busy nightclub and it gets sweaty. Everyone's inside <laughs> there, they're dancing, they're on the dance floor and it's it gets sweaty and hot because everyone's kind of moving and jiggling around and, and you get all this heat generated. And that's what happens in the middle of a star. But in the middle of the star isn't people, obviously it's, it's little atoms of hydrogen and helium and they start jostling together and dancing and they start colliding. And when they do, you, you occasionally, very occasionally get um, a collision that forms um, a bigger atom. So two hydrogen atoms stick together, form a helium atom. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic gist. And um, they create energy and that's called nuclear fusion. It's a nuclear bomb. The sun is a giant ball of gas that's so jiggly in the middle, stuff collides together, atoms stick together, and they create bigger atoms. And that's essentially what's happening. And that creates huge, huge quantities of energy. And that is what's shining in the sun. Now, it's a bit more nuanced and complicated. Mm -hmm. It's actually a, a really difficult process to, to understand. If, if you want to Google it, it's called the proton-proton chain. Lots of different um, reactions are happening, but essentially tiny bits of atoms are sticking together, creating energy. Um, they don't create light. In fact, it's quite interesting. They, they um, generate um, these really high energy things called gamma rays and those gamma rays decay into smaller, less energetic rays like light and heat later on as they pervade through the sun from the center towards the outside. And that process takes hundreds of thousands of years um, for the energy to get from the middle of the sun to the surface. So it's, it's pretty cool and it's pretty slow and um, it's, it's basically a giant bomb. <laughs> And is that the same? You, you couldn't make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> is that the same across all stars then? There's that kind of nuclear reaction going on? Yeah, and there's subtle differences too. So in a star like our sun, our sun's a pretty average star and it's it's fairly puny and small. Um, there are some stars that are hundreds of thousands of times more radiant and, and brighter. In fact, millions of times brighter in the, in the case of the biggest star in the universe. So... Our sun's pretty small and it's mainly hydrogen sticking together in the middle, turning into helium. And that kind of, that's the nuclear fusion process that, that burns the, the energy in the star and creates the, the heat and light. But in bigger stars, more massive stars, it's even hotter. It's like having a huge dance floor, thousands of people, you know, maybe even like Glastonbury, you know, there's a huge crowd and there's so much energy that everyone's moshing and there's a huge amount of heat going on. And then you get even bigger nuclear reactions. You get helium fusing into carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and bigger elements are created. So if you remember at school, the, the um, periodic table of the elements, so all the chemicals, they go from the smallest ones, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and they go up to heavier ones and you get up to uranium and you know, crazy metals and stuff and all the radioactive stuff. And then the ones you've never heard of, like Einsteinium and technetium and stuff <laughs> like that. I thought you were going to go through them all there for a minute. 
Oh, no, do, do you know what? I, I can't quite do that. I'm not Rain Man, <laughs> but um, yeah. um, <laughs> I can show off with the first few. But yeah, it's, it's a fascinating process. So yeah, small stars burn hydrogen into helium and bigger stars burn stuff like carbon and oxygen and they create the things that go into our bodies um, that, that we're made of, that our, that our you know, bodies and bones and, and flesh is made of. So we're made of the stars. It's, it's a lovely, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I think it's interesting you're talking about the sun there as, as quite an average star, but it, it's something that I find particularly fascinating. I think probably from an existential point of view of it, it's so important for us in our existence. Um, so it's, it's interesting to hear it being described as an average star. Yeah, I mean it's average, but it's not boring, and it's it's also mm. unusual in the in the sense that it lives on its own, and a lot of stars live in in groups or families. So, you know, it's unusual and and fantastic in many ways because it's not like red dwarfs, which are very um, angry and um, they have flares, and you know these flares not like um, bell bottoms, but more like um, you know angry shouty episodes where they exude huge amounts of energy very rapidly and um, they irradiate their environments so if we lived around a red dwarf star we would we would get nowhere very fast with there would be no life on earth so the the fact that we live around the earth um uh, we live on earth around the sun means that we're living in a very um stable environment it's a stable family environment which is what allows us to be such a beautiful planet full of life and the sun itself has already gone through some stages and will go through other stages of its existence. Can you talk us through those? Yeah, so the sun began pretty much as it is now, um, uh, perhaps a little bit um, hotter. Um, and then it sort of sits down into its stable life as burning hydrogen to helium. Now, that's a really long process and that will go on. It's been going on for about four and a half billion years. It will go on for another four or five billion years to come and it will be really stable. But slowly the, the sun will increase its luminosity and that means it will get brighter um, and a little bit um change it change a little bit in color as well get a little bit more orange um and that's because you know when you were a kid i don't know if you had a coal fire but i had a coal fire at home when i was a kid that heated the house yeah and um the the coal would kind of glow red and then you get the ash around it so you kind of get the sort of black surface of the coal anyway the ash is actually created in a, in a star as well as being created in a coal fire or a wood burner or something like that so you've got this kind of process in the sun where you're burning hydrogen to helium creating light and heat that's all good but you're creating ash as well and the ash is the helium that's the kind of leftover and at the temperature of the sun that the helium can't burn so that's why it's ash it's just kind of sitting there outside of the core of the sun where the the burning's happening so you've got this kind of dark ash and the sun's not hot enough for it to burn so it, it's kind of just sits there uh, and and kind of inhibits the burning of the sun so at some point in the future um, the sun will eventually start to contract in its core and get hotter and the helium will start to burn and that will be this wonderful event called a helium flash where we get helium burning it makes the sun a lot hotter um, and a lot brighter and it will go into a new phase of its life which will be fascinating um, and it may even form a planetary nebula which is a beautiful glowing um, I guess region of gas like a beautiful cocoon of gas around it that will glow blues and, and reds and, and green colors um, and they're, they're wonderful objects planetary nebula because they're they're stars just like the sun that have got towards the end of their lives and started to shed their extraneous gas that they're not burning because the very center of the star has got very hot and started to blow away that gas and it's a wonderful future and it's going to be really interesting to to um, imagine what it will be like for humans if they could live on planet earth at that time if we haven't got too hot and killed ourselves um, <laughs> in the meantime um 
how can we actually know what's going on inside the sun, particularly getting down to those deeper levels? How do we actually go about studying that? Yeah, it's um, a combination of things. So the, the first big leap in understanding the sun was something called a spectrograph. And that's a, a machine that breaks down the light of the sun into a rainbow. So you basically got a prism, that kind of thing. You know, when you look through a piece of glass or you're drinking a whiskey or something, you've got a beautiful cut crystal glass and um, you shine it up to the light and you create little rainbows. You can see the colors um, mm. created through that. So that's, that's the kind of thing we do with images of the sun. We get a prism or a, um, a kind of a grating, if you if you like that terminology when you study physics, but <laughs> a machine that spreads the light out into rainbow. And when you look at the rainbow of the sun, all the colors, um, you see little colors have been nibbled out and they're missing and there's just blackness on these little colors. It's amazing. So it's like a barcode. Mm -hmm. So you get this rainbow and you've got a barcode of black lines across it. And that's called the absorption spectrum. So a spectrum is just the, the rainbow and the absorption stuff is where little bits of um, gas in the sun have, have absorbed light that's coming out from the center. And the exact shape of that barcode tells us which chemicals are in the sun. And it tells us what temperature they're at as well from the, the width of the barcodes. So we can kind of do a lab experiment on earth. We can burn different gases and see what colors are nibbled out of the spectrum. And then we compare it to the actual sun and we, we create the spectrum and we look at the, the colors and they're nibbled out in the particular places and we can compare it to the one we've done in the lab and we can measure which chemicals are there and how hot they are. So it's really clever. We can kind of, without going to the sun, because it's bloody hot, <laughs> um, we can actually see what's in there and what's happening and how hot it's burning and which chemicals are burning um, and using theoretical um, modeling, which is kind of like number crunching in a computer, we can figure out how hot the sun is and what's burning in there. I think that's a really interesting point as well, because I do some number crunching for my day job. And I think it sounds a lot like a lot of astronomy now is done in that way, looking at data rather than necessarily looking through a telescope at the sky. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I've, I've spent my whole career as a radio astronomer. So mm. I look through radio telescopes. We can't, you know, Put our eye up to that and we can't see anything it's invisible <laughs> um so everything we do is number crunching um it's using um techniques mathematical techniques to recreate the image that we think we're measuring because what we're actually measuring is a voltage in in a wire at the end of a telescope it's literally just um, we get a reflective mirror kind of a dish shape like um, your satellite dish you're watching sky tv or something um, we just get a huge one of those um, and we we measure the voltage at the end of a wire and um, we measure that over time and and that tells us which signals we're receiving from space and where they come from and how bright they are and how polarized they are, and which directions the electric and magnetic field are going and all those kinds of things. So it's it's really a, a sort of astrophysical experiment just to make a picture of a galaxy with a radio telescope. <laughs> um, and, and it's a huge thing to, to make images because we have to do all sorts of mathematics. We have to use a supercomputer. We have to correlate uh, signals together from different telescopes across the world. So it's pretty complicated. Um, yeah, it's not, a, not an easy feat, but um, you know, it's a really useful thing to do. There's so many things combined in there, just the, the invention of that whole process itself and then the multiple um, kind of subject areas. You know, you're talking about the mass and things there that goes into it that I think is just such a great example of the ingenuity of humans when, you know, when we can put our minds together and produce like just really amazing feats like that. It is. It's amazing. Yeah, radio astronomy is a, a really counterintuitive i guess it's not easy to imagine how it works so you have to use those you know engineering mixed with mathematics mixed with computing um, mixed with this obviously an astronomy kind of understanding so when i work professionally with other people it's generally with people from a huge range of different backgrounds in terms of education you know a lot of engineers and they're very important because they're the ones who actually get it working 
Uh, so if we get back to the stars then, you've already mentioned Red Dwarfs quite a few times, both the TV show and the the stars. So in, <laughs> in terms of the stars, what what is a Red Dwarf? Well, a Red Dwarf is actually the most common type of star, but you wouldn't know it looking in the night sky because you can't see any. Um, for a start, you know, when you look up at the sky without a telescope, you can't see a single red dwarf. Um, and they're the most plentiful stars, you know, the, I think it's more than 60% of stars are red dwarfs. So um, they're just small stars. They're just really small, um, a lot smaller than the sun that are a lot cooler than the sun. And that's why they're red, because um, red, red means cool, um, blue means hot in terms of physics and um, and how stars shine. So they're a lot smaller than the sun. They live a lot longer. Um, they very steadily and slowly burn their fuel, uh, hydrogen into helium. But young red dwarfs, um, although they're cool and, and steady, they're, they're actually plagued by temper tantrums. So they have huge stellar flares. So they, they just go nuts occasionally. They will just have tangled magnetic fields that mean that um, quite occasionally the magnetic fields will snap and they will just expel huge amounts of radiation, hot plasma gas into space. Um, so although we are kind of interested in looking for planets around red dwarfs and we find a lot of them, we're not sure if they could potentially host life because of these temper tantrums. So um, it's a really interesting question in terms of uh, the likelihood of other life in the universe as to whether red dwarfs could even have life because of these enormous ejections of hot radiation. You mentioned there about their how long they live. Um, how can we measure how long a star's life would actually be? Because I assume that's much longer than our lives are. So how, how can we measure that? Yeah, God. So, so we, um, again, using a bit of number crunching and also um, measuring, um, firstly, we can use clever techniques like we can build a time machine. <laughs> I know okay. that sounds rid ridiculous, <laughs> but we could build a time machine. It's called, it's called a telescope. So, firstly, you can um, you can actually look at. Um, we don't do it much for stars, but we do it for galaxies. You can you can look a long way away, and you can see stuff that is very very old. So, um, for example, you can see, um, you know. 10 billion years into the distance, light years away. That's because of the length of time it takes for the light to actually reach us? Absolutely, yeah. So the speed of light is is a finite like cosmic speed limit. So the, the light has taken so long to travel to us that, that we can th see things as they were 10 billion years ago or more. But with stars, it's even easier because the stars that we can see are very close. We know the age of the stars um, because of their composition. And again, it goes back to this barcode thing. If we're looking at the light and we're spreading it out, we can see which chemicals are in there. And in the early universe, there was only hydrogen and helium because those were the elements created in the Big Bang, a tiny, tiny bit of lithium, but nothing above that, nothing heavier than that in the periodic table. So if we see a star... Um, and it's red and it's faint, and also it's only made of hydrogen and helium, we know that it's very, very old. But if it's got carbon and nitrogen, oxygen and you know uranium or gold or silver in it, we know that it must be a second generation or more of stars because those elements are only made inside stars. So like our sun has a lot of complicated elements in it. So we know that it's not the first generation of stars. It's actually come later after the first generation has burnt its stuff, exploded, spewed its gas into space and created new stars again. So it's really about the composition, the chemicals that make up the stars that tell us how old they are. You mentioned Proxima Centauri um, in the book. Is that a red dwarf? Yeah, it is. Yeah, Proxima Centauri is the, the closest star to Earth, and it's actually a member of um, a three-star family, uh, Alpha Centauri A and B are the other two. Um, you can't see those from uh, Europe, maybe the very southern tip of Europe possibly, but um, you can. they're very bright and obvious from the southern hemisphere or the 
the sort of equatorial regions of Earth. So, you know, Alpha Centauri is one of the pointers to the Southern Cross. So if you're down this way, um, it'll be really obvious. But Alpha Centauri is obvious because it's a, it's a bright star. It's really big and bright. But Proxima Centauri is not obvious at all. It, it's very, very faint. Um, it can only be seen with quite a powerful telescope. Even a large amateur telescope can't see it. So again, even though it's only four light years away, 4.2 light years or so, it's very, very close to Earth. We can't see it with the naked eye or even with a large telescope. So that just tells you how faint these stars are and um, really quite pathetic and puny. And what else is hiding out of there in the universe? You know, it's so much cool stuff out there from dark matter to, um, you know, hidden gas to, to these billions or trillions of red dwarf stars just, just sitting there chilling out. Yeah, and this this was a bit of a, um, a part of the book that I thought um, it made me feel a little bit depressed, uh, not of, not because of anything that you spiffed, um the way you wrote the book or anything, but it's just the idea that you talked about uh, you could fly to Proxima Centauri um, there and back again 10 times in a rocket if it could travel close to the speed of light. And it just really kind of struck me how far off we are from being able to do things like that. Yeah, we are. We're we're rubbish. I tell you what, you know, we <laughs> how long have we taken to get to the edge of the solar system? Yeah. You know, the Voyager one and two have just crossed the boundary and you know, they were they were launched in the nineteen seventies. So um, you know, it's it's spent my whole life travelling throughout the solar system and uh, only just reached the edge and there is an inordinate amount of nothingness between here and the next star so it's yeah it's pretty depressing and also you know even when we can travel at the speed of light there's not that much that we can actually travel to even mm -hmm. if we reach that absolutely ultimate speed limit of the universe so i think we've really as humanity we've got to think about preserving our beautiful planet that we have here firstly but you know also thinking about clever ways to um to communicate with extraterrestrials if we do find them and I'm not talking about, you know, crazy ET theories of Roswell, but, you know, <laughs> there may well be intelligent life out there somewhere. Um, it's just unlikely to be anywhere near us, I think. And is this where um, Proxima Centauri and, and Proxima B, if I've gotten it right, um, are quite an important part in the search for other life? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the closest, Proxima Centauri is the, the closest star and Proxima B is a, a sort of Earth-like planet in the habitable zone, which means a place where it's potentially possible that liquid water could exist because it's not too hot that it's all boiled off and it's not too cold that it's all frozen or, you know, disappeared. So that's a pretty exciting thing that the closest star to us in the whole universe has a planet that's like the Earth and it's rocky and it's um, probably 1.2 or 1.4 times more massive than the Earth. So it's very similar, very similar in, in cosmic terms. That's cool. I mean, it's not ridiculous that we could send a microsatellite within the next 50 years to actually, you know, shoot that towards Proxima B and go and explore. The only problem is it couldn't have humans on board, which is fine. Um, <laughs> we could send a camera, uh, you know, we could Skype, whatever. <laughs> Um, but you know that's pretty cool, and I think that's the next giant yeah. leap in our in terms of our discovery in the you know in the nearby universe. Yeah, that that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, I'll I'll come back it to would. that because I've a, have a related question to that a bit later. But I wanted to move on to um, in the book you talk about stars who are cannibals. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and you know it's 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 something that really brings to brings to mind for me. Uh, the original animated Transformers movie with Unicron that is a uh, planet trans that transforms into a robot that devours other planets. Such a good kind of sci-fi um, kind of image. <laughs> uh, so can you tell us about some of the the uh, actual real life non-fiction cannibal stars? Yeah, I mean it's it's actually quite common that. Um two stars live together or three or four or five or six or seven even. So our sun's pretty unusual that it lives alone. 
it's it's more usual that a star is is with others so if you're talking about sci-fi you know the the classic is Tatooine the the fictional planet where Luke Skywalker's from and you know it has several suns and it's got this amazing sunset with different suns in the sky now that's a very common thing for a planet to actually have more than one sun um and it's also not unusual for two stars to be very close to one another when they're orbiting so you'll you'll have let's say it's a double star so you have two stars orbiting their common center of gravity so they're spinning around each other doing a little waltz a bit of a dance in space and one will get too close to the other now if there's a big star and a, a compact small star the small star will be more powerful gravitationally and it'll start pulling gas from the other star kind of sucking it like spaghetti into its mouth and you get this amazing situation where one star is then cannibalizing its neighbor or its partner um which is crazy to think you know that stars are actually actively eating each other <laughs> but this is happening all over the universe and we see it and we can watch the the gas screaming down into the other star we can see the the discs of material as they they kind of suck down a and we can see the catastrophic um ending of these kinds of episodes which is called a type one supernova where one star is is eating so much gas from another it gets overwhelmed it gets too greedy and it actually explodes as a supernova completely destroys itself turns itself inside out because it's been eating too much too fast and um, that that's what we're dealing with so cannibalism in terms of stars is is not a good thing quite often a supernova then is is where a star actually explodes it is yeah supernova is um it, the most catastrophic and and final event in the life of a star if if a star goes supernova that's it you know it, it's um entire apart from the very center the very core its entire body just catastrophically destructs self-destructs and, and it explodes into space at huge velocities and this whole process takes just seconds um, and it's gone the star's gone and it, it's immediately brighter than an entire galaxy of 100 billion stars um, just for a few weeks it, it shines brighter than its host galaxy so it's a huge event it's it's very very unusual um, we only expect you know one or two supernovae every century or so in a galaxy so it's um yeah it's pretty dramatic and uh we're pretty lucky that our sun isn't messing about with any other stars that's for sure <laughs> so does it come about then really through that cannibalization process it does that's one type of supernova so the type 1a it's called um so that that's one where the stars cannibalizing another another type of supernova and it's the same process as is a star exploding um, but it's caused when a star a very massive star so a big heavy star um, comes to the end of its life and that happens because it's run out of fuel at the center so whether it's burning hydrogen into helium or then it gets a bit hotter and manages to burn helium into carbon nitrogen and oxygen the slightly heavier chemicals at the end it'll get to a stage where it's kind of run out of options it's got no more fuel left and at that stage the star itself will collapse gravitationally because gravity is pulling it in constantly the shining the heat and the, the creation of energy is pushing it outwards and that pulling in by gravity and the pushing out by energy balances nicely and that's why a star kind of sits there and shines nicely um, not collapsing and not exploding at any one time but when the fuel runs out, suddenly it can't shine anymore and it starts collapsing because the gravity takes over. And that catastrophic collapse of the core of a star, the middle of a star, that creates a rebound effect. When it gets to a certain point, it explodes. And that catastrophic explosion is, again, um, hundreds of billions of times brighter than the star was previously just for a few days um, and over a number of weeks it fades back down to a level that's barely detectable and it's kind of a last one song for that that star
It's a bit of a hey, notice me before I disappear. It is. It's uh, very needy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, look at me. I'm dying. <laughs> How's someone do that? <laughs> <laughs> that also sounds like um, something that we'd want to be very far away from. So there's the supernovae have been like close to us, like in the Milky Way, or, or are we just seeing them beyond that? Yeah, we, we've done, um, you know, calculations about that. If there was any near us, very close to us, but within about 50 parsecs, I think, which is about 150 light years, we'd be screwed. Um, and we don't <laughs> want that to happen because supernovae explode. Um, the, the actual gas that explodes isn't going to hit us. That's fine. Like gas doesn't hurt us. But the energy, the, the radiation mm. is the stuff that we need to worry about. And um, we'd have gamma rays, which aren't good. X-rays, again, not good. Um, we'd have high-velocity particles called cosmic rays, which are electrons and protons, the guts of the atoms, like spewing out towards us at the speed of light. That stuff's not good either. Um, and although we're protected on Earth by our beautiful magnetic field that creates the aurora borealis that we see as the northern lights occasionally, um, that is... A, a protective shield that has its faults and um if a supernova hits us it might strip our entire ozone layer from very close range so luckily that's not going to happen because we don't actually have any stars close by that should go supernova anytime soon that's that's Things very crossed. good to know um it is good to know yeah it's one less thing to worry about <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, we've definitely got enough to worry about at the minute don't we yeah, 2020, we don't need any. <laughs> um, and again, going back to the kind of sci-fi tropes, when I think of a star exploding, you, you've you got that huge kind of bright flash um, and then there's almost like a contraction that ends up like a black hole. Uh, so I'm wondering if there are supernova linked to black holes or is that just a bit of a, that's just a, a bit of a nice kind of animation to create? No, that's in real life. That's it. That's how black holes are made, or at least some types of black holes. Mm. Um, so, yeah, if, if a star is um, more than about eight times the mass of our sun, so it's eight times heavier than the sun, um, it will get to the end of its life and it will go supernova. Um, if it's lighter than that, it, it doesn't bother. It, it just kind of evolves into a white dwarf and the rest of the star kind of fluffs off into space um, and that's the end of our sun but yeah heavier stars will catastrophically explode they're, they're, they're kind of doing this look at me ending um, and very heavy um, cores of the stars at the end of their lives about 1.2 times the mass of our sun if the core of the star is that that much bigger than the sun it will collapse into a black hole and really people think that black holes are kind of weird and magical but they're not they're just a star the center of a star that has run out of fuel um, the rest of the stars exploded into space so you can forget about that stuff but the middle of the star just keeps collapsing and keeps collapsing and keeps collapsing into a very small space and beyond a certain point the gravity gets so strong around that object that light can't escape and that's a black hole that's it um, it's nothing more mysterious, although we'll never see one with our own eyes. It's nothing more mysterious than the, the center of a star. Um, what we don't understand is, is what the matter looks like. And by that, I mean, it won't be made of atoms anymore. It'll all be squished together. And we don't understand how that works. Mm -hmm. Is a black hole a bit like the reversal of the start of the universe at the Big Bang? It's not in the t in in the sense that when a black hole is formed, it's no longer collapsing. Um, so it's not kind of constantly collapsing in like a you know you might imagine from sci-fi. So it's pretty stable actually. But although a black hole can eat stuff, it can eat material from outside and it can fall in, and it gets a bit bigger. It's pretty stable um, once it's made. But but the Big Bang was really a a different type of process and we, we don't understand why it happened but all evidence points to the fact that it did happen 13.8 billion years ago or so um, where all of space and time just expanded from one point 
We don't know what happened before that, whether there was a universe before that. We don't know why it happened or what catalyzed it. Um, but we know it did happen because it's still happening now. The Big Bang is still happening. Um, space is still expanding between objects. Um, the universe is still accelerating. Um, and and we're heading for God knows where. We don't know <laughs> what will happen in the future, whether we'll just kind of even out into a big, big space time. We'll keep expanding forever or we'll go into a big crunch. But the universe currently looks like it will just keep expanding forever. And what a weird thought that is, because eventually we get to the end and, well, there will be no end, but we'll get to a point where every object in space is so far away from every other object that light won't be able to travel between them. And so the universe will be kind oh, wow. of big, dark and empty, which is and, kind of crap, isn't it? Yeah, and obviously it makes it even more difficult for us to reach other places. Yeah, well, that's it. We get in early, that's what I say. <laughs> Let's do it now before the universe expands too much. <laughs> yeah, in the book you mention um, the biggest stars, O types, and there's one in particular that we see as being the biggest star we know of. Yeah, Big Ray. Is that the one you're talking about? I yeah, gave them a Big name Ray, because... Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's nice to give them names that aren't like KT1482654 or whatever. That's the thing. I mean, every star in the universe has a name, but it's rubbish. It's just a series of, it's a jumble of letters and numbers. It's like a troll on Twitter, you know, so it's it's just got this random kind of sequence. And Big, Big Ray is, as far as we know, I mean, let's be honest, we don't know exactly, but it's, it's so far the biggest um, star we found in the whole universe. Um, I called him Big Ray because it was called R136A1 or something. It sort of sounded a bit like Ray. So, you know, the sun is huge. It's mind-bogglingly massive. But Big Ray is 315 or so times more massive than the sun. Um, is about 9 million times brighter and is just spewing out this wind of material about a thousand kilometers per second a thousand kilometers per second and and by wind i mean all this kind of material that's flying off the surface of the sun the things that are shining the the tiny particles flying off it, it is all kind of just absolutely overwhelming and it, this is a star that's seen not in our own galaxy, but in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a, the nearest kind of medium-sized galaxy to us. Um, this star is so big and hot. We've got to remember that it's absolutely bonkers, this, that it shines in the ultraviolet. It's so hot. So most stars are like red or blue or white or something. Mm. This star is invisible in terms of the peak of its radiation, it's ultraviolet star. So Big Ray is um, really a case in point as to the, the huge variation in the mass of stars and the ways in which they manifest their lives. And again, Ray will be probably dead in a few million years, whereas our star will last for 10 billion years. So you either live fast and die young or you <laughs> Are slow and steady and win the race in the world of stars <laughs> tortoise stars that's it <laughs> what would you be what would i oh pro probably a tortoise star i think i think i was always one of those people were like uh you know i wouldn't leave homework to the last minute or that sort of thing like i'd, I'd do bits of it yeah. a bit at a time I, I, yeah i, I just you. find that a bit of an easier way to approach stuff <laughs> I'm the same. <laughs> I think I, I don't like having to deal with the stress of the last minute uh, kind That's of approach. That's it. <laughs> and you start self-destructing and exploding as a supernova. It's not good. <laughs> well, maybe uh, that's that's a really cool question. Actually, maybe you should do one of those kind of uh, internet questionnaires that tell you what star you would be based on your personality. Oh, which star are you? That's such a great idea. Do yeah. you know what? I might do that. Get, get it on your website. To credit you for that. Amazing. <laughs> um, which star are you? B.Y. Canis Majoris or <laughs> Proxima Centauri. <laughs> do you have large outbursts, violent occasional outbursts <laughs> or do you constantly roar like a tiger? I love it. <laughs> 
uh, there was a really interesting chapter in the book called Enigmas, and you had some kind of stars there were there. They were just quite unusual. I think the one that stood out for me, um, well, I think there was two there, but I, I've absolutely no idea if I'm saying this right, but it, I think it's uh, Sibilski's star. Oh, Probilski star. Pr- yeah, almost Probilski like I think we probably yeah. both both got it fairly wrong but um <laughs> i've been to poland so i can vaguely pronounce some polish yeah. words but yeah i think it's like Przybilski star but mm-hmm. yeah there's yeah what i mean what it lacks in in vowels it makes up for in personality as i <laughs> joked in the, the book but it's um it's a star that it's it's just amazing because it's it's radioactive um in a way that we we don't really understand and that that's fascinating um you know, radioactivity is the sign of heavy elements, but elements that are very complex and have built up over a number of billions of years through stars um, and stars burning more heavy and complicated elements into each other. So it's kind of a, a bit of an enigma. Um, we've got lots of enigmatic stars in, in, in our galaxy, but this is a, a real um confusing one because we we really don't understand where this radioactivity has come from um whether it's created by a natural process um whether it was there in the first place when the star was formed um or actually whether it's put there artificially by aliens (laughs) (laughs) and i love that because it's daft it sounds daft but think about it if you were an alien intelligent creature from you know 100 light years away a thousand light years away how would you get our attention Mm. how would you try and tell us of your presence would you emit radio waves would you send like your family photo albums through the sky with a laser or would you maybe create some weirdness in the universe that other intelligent (laughs) creatures might notice out of the general boringness of all of space. So, you know, there is this school of thought and it's a bit odd and a bit weird, but not necessarily off the scale um, that suggests that, you know, unusual stars like this are maybe signals from other intelligent creatures. I'm not necessarily going to judge that one, but um, (laughs) it's an interesting thought. I like it. Well, it seems quite related to the kind of alien Prometheus idea of aliens actually creating life on Earth as well. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, we honestly don't know. Um, And we are the only planet in the whole universe that we have currently um, able to, that we're currently able to study life because we we just haven't seen it anywhere else. So who knows um, whether we came from asteroids or comets uh, or mars or another place you know we recently found an interstellar rock um called Amuamua running through our <laughs> solar system and buggering off back to wherever it came from that's a good name who's named that one yeah uh, that's a ancient hawaiian um that's a sorry a native hawaiian language um name which means a a traveler or something i think it's a beautiful name it's fascinating to imagine um where life on earth could have come from and also where it could have got to as well because there are certainly um, lots of meteorites on earth that originated on mars um, Mm -hmm. and the amazing tremendous collisions that have happened between um, asteroids and the other planets and also through volcanic action have created this kind of sharing of material between the different planets so and and as we found with Oumuamua this rock that's come from interstellar space there could have even been mixing of material from interstellar space all the way across you know thousands millions of light years um, to our planet so who knows it's pretty cool yeah it was a, that one I thought was really interesting um, so I think we're coming up to time. I want to let you go and have your dinner with your family. Cool, have me stuff, tea. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, there was just kind of one other, well, well, maybe maybe I'll sneak in another one, but one question I want to ask, just if you could project yourself into the future um, to find a discovery around something that's a really burning question for you at the minute in astronomy that we don't know the answer to yet, uh, where would you, 
what would it be that you want to find out the most about if you could? This is really interesting to think about what you'd like to discover because often <laughs> discoveries in astronomy are really unexpected mm. and we just find something and we're like what the hell is this you know more recently we found fast radio bursts for example and as a radio astronomer it's really in interesting to to figure out what these things are um we've been looking for about 50 years for signs of um radio waves from other planets maybe from leaking from extraterrestrial intelligence mm -hmm. uh, you know things like ourselves who communicate with radio and we found these ginormous bursts of radio waves from other places now they're most likely not from other living creatures but what they do do is they make us think about paradigms we haven't considered before so these fast radio bursts are huge energetic bursts of radio waves that last less than a, a millisecond and you know it's just a tremendous amount of energy and physics has gone into that it's probably actually just a black hole eating something <laughs> um, but but really what it tells us is that it's important to look out there for 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 these new things and, and that's one of the things i'd love to to be learning more about but, you know, another thing that we have to admit as astronomers is that we don't know what 98% of the universe is made of. Hmm. It's um, where is the dark matter in the universe and, and really what um, is hiding out there. And that's one of the kind of embarrassing things for astronomers is, is that the atoms that we know about and the hydrogen and helium and the, the regular particles and electrons and you know, protons and neutrons and stuff, that's about 4% of the universe. Um, the rest is actually invisible and completely unknowable at present. It's not made of that stuff. Um, and we can see the effect of the gravity of this other stuff, whatever it is out there, but we can't find it yet. So it's going to take a really big observational effort in terms of looking at the large scale structure of the universe and seeing how it's moving under the influence of gravity of this dark matter and also trying to understand through particle physics what it might be made of whether it's made of undiscovered particles or something like that um, so it's a real interesting bit of science because it looks at the very largest things in the universe and the very smallest things in the universe the particles the subatomic world and the large-scale structure of the universe so that's something that I think is going to be really cool. And I've got some popcorn and I'm just going to be eating that and watching it. <laughs> and I, I think those ideas are such, have such great links to other subjects as well. Like not, not just the physics, astrophysics, but like there are huge philosophical questions there that come up through those discoveries as well that I think are, are really fascinating. Yeah, I love the link between the smallest and largest. Um, mm. And, it, you know, it's all existential. Um, it kind of leads to the questions about um, what is unknowable and what is knowable. And also what else could there be on Earth that we do not yet know or comprehend or even know is there. And that that's the existential stuff and that leads into the... the uh, unknowable realms of spirituality and uh, philosophy yeah. and all those kind of metaphysical things which is really interesting to talk about mm. when um you're having a late night with some friends and um <laughs> you know but it's just it's just fascinating and um i think as scientists we don't think about that stuff enough mm -hmm. and we kind of compartmentalize it as not science and it's you know ugh. but um i think as you get older you you sort of start to realize that that stuff is is equally interesting and valid um, as a line of inquiry and um, be nice to collaborate more with philosophers and things to um, to pose those questions because they are interesting ones uh, yes that, that sounds fantastic I'll, I'll be reading those books when they happen <laughs> sounds good yeah <laughs> um so lisa that's a really good point for us to stop let you go and you can fill your belly a bit but um please tell us where to get your book from well, you can get all of my books from um, lisaharveysmith.com, my website, and I actually send them out worldwide. I can sign them to you. Um, I've got 
a kid's book under the stars astrophysics for bedtime and two books for adults um secret life of stars and when galaxies collide and look i've written a fourth one as well so they'll keep on rolling out to you so what's but, that one uh, about yeah, jump on my website well the new one hasn't, hasn't even been announced i'm giving you exclusive here right? oh nice Ready? <laughs> oh it's cool it's called aliens and other worlds it's actually um for oh. young people and it's 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 really about the history of life on earth and the possibility of life on other planets and and thinking about what that could mean for humanity and what it could look like it's pretty cool that sounds amazing um lisa do you want to tell us about your twitter or anything else like that yeah you can follow me on social media so i'm pretty much everywhere as myself lisa harvey smith um and uh, yeah you might find some interesting tidbits from uh, my life as an astronomer and uh some discoveries coming through there as well so yeah i'll see you there that'd be brilliant lisa thanks very much that was great yeah fabulous nice talking to you lee i hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode Remember to rate and review the show on your podcast app to help us get noticed. And you can get in touch on Twitter or through the website. Bye for now. Curiosity